So we're obviously we've talked a lot about photogrammetry and use of drones and things like that today. So we're going to um, um, talk about some case studies um, and our observations on the ground and what we see from the results of those surveys. Um, so basically, we've been doing um, normal photogrammetry. Uh, so that's RGB with normal cameras, uh, multispectral uh, photogrammetry with um, cameras that um, pick up the bands of light that we can't see with the naked eye, um, and also thermal photogrammetry, so using thermal cameras and mapping landscapes, looking at the difference in temperature that's coming out of the ground. Um, and then, of course, we've been doing um, GIS analysis, putting all of those results um, into GIS and then interpreting those and producing reports. Now, we've chosen some um, case studies which are uh, uh, research-based projects rather than commercial ones. Um, but today we've been talking a lot about um, having the ability to go out and actually do um, ground-based survey as well as doing the um, the aerial surveys. Um, we are often, with commercial projects, not afforded the um, time and um, budget and that sort of thing to actually go out and do the ground-based survey as well. It's mainly limited to our time on site going around with a GPS putting in ground control points. Um, however, with some of the research projects, we are um, able to spend a bit more time um, having a look at what's going on on the ground um, and in some cases also able to go back um, and actually look at uh, the results um, in the next um, year's field season when we're, potentially we can get trenches put in and things like that as well. So um, we're going to talk about some uh, circles in, uh, that have been recently discovered in South Wales. Uh, we're going to talk about the surveys that we've done at Stonehenge and we're going to talk about um, uh, another site called Arthur Stone in Herefordshire. Um, so I'm going to introduce the, the first site before I hand over to Scott, uh, who's going to talk about the multispectral imaging and then talk through the results. Um, so the circles in South Wales um, were really uh, only recently, like 2018, um, spotted by um, Toby Driver from the Royal Commission in Wales. Um, and there seems to be a change in the way the land was managed, a change into organic farming, which means that for some reason that's meant that these um, crop circles uh, have shown up, uh, or crop marks have shown up, and he's been able to photograph them then and brought them to the, the Stones of Stonehenge project where we've then gone out and done all our surveys on it uh, a later date and including geophysics as well. And so without further ado, I'll hand over to Scott. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to go deeply into um, multispectral analysis. I think we may get a little bit of that later. Um, but I just wanted to give you an idea of um, what sort of sits behind um, multispectral. So multispectral cameras have um, multiple sensors on them. The one that we have has five sensors. So we, um, we take images in the blue, green, red, near infrared and red edge bands. And through various formulae, we are able to manipulate that data to get different results, um, looking at the health of the vegetation, the chlorophyll in the vegetation, which is a good sort of proxy indicator of what's potentially under the ground. Um, archaeology being as vampiric as it is, this is all sort of stolen from agriculture. Um, agriculture have developed many, many of these um, formulas and techniques. And we use a suite of about 20, um, depending on the type of site that we have. So um, NDVI, the Normalised Difference Vegetation Index, is the one that you will mostly see, that and GNDVI, which is the Green Normalised ve uh, Difference Vegetation Index. And um, if anybody knows about the new uh, Mavic 3 that's coming out from DJI, they've gone for a four-band uh, multispectral, so they've removed the blue, uh, which isn't particularly useful to us because we use the blue band quite a lot. They're focusing on agriculture, where the NDVI and the GNDVI produce pretty good results for crop analysis. Um, enhanced Vegetation Index is, is very useful um, for reducing, um, sorry, for when you've got a high vegetation uh, count. Osavi uh, we use when we've got uh, large areas of bare soil on the site. And uh, Gary is uh, most often used when we're trying to cut out atmospheric effects. 
So when you're flying a multi-spectral camera, ideally you want um, either a nice overcast day without a change of light, or you want a very sunny day without a change of light. When we get sort of changes through um, cloud cover, it can affect the results, and that does sort of matter. That needs to be noted when we, we do our survey so that we, we can see that when we start to interpret. Okay, Adam, should we move on to the next one? So this is, um, this is an NDVI output for the, uh, the, the, the circles. And, I mean, you can see the circles quite clearly on there. Um, there's, there's four, two larger, two smaller. This is basically achieved um, in GIS. We use QGIS. And using the raster calculator, we can use those formulae to subtract, to add, to do various different things between the different bands. And this gives us our outputs. Um, so that's a GNDVI, the green. So you can see that it's picking up different data. There's a, there's a dark band running down um, sort of slightly obliquely across the site. That's actually a change in the geology on the site. Um, so that's being picked up in the crop, which I believe was clover it's on the site. A mix of grass and clover. Glass and, grass and clover. Um, so between the first, the, the NDVI and the GNDVI, you can see that different things are showing up. The archaeology is still kind of remains consistent. Um, what have we got here? It's, uh, uh, one I didn't discuss, HDRAR. So again, it's, um, it's, picking up, uh, it's picking up different um, lights and darks. Do you want to keep moving through? Yeah. Keep going. And one more. That's completely useless. <laughs> um, actually, if you, if you go back one, yeah. I, think, I think it's because the lights are on, it's, it's dark. Um, no, no, turn off if you like. Yeah, that would be better. You, you'll, have to, you'll have to believe me. Um, there's, there's actually a kind of a, a darker band that runs just down here in this area here. Um, and, there's, and there's some other sort of little bits that show up over here. So if we go to the thermal. So the thermal, um, you can pick out the archaeological features, but the thermal didn't really show a great deal of difference. Um, than the the NDVI, so it's good to have it, um, but it's it's not it's not really illustrating or depicting what's actually going on. But we're taking a kind of a stacked approach. Yeah. You know, one one piece of data is is okay, but more data, if we can get more data of the same area through different processes, then that allows us to kind of build up our interpretations. Move on. Although the features actually showing this, they're not very clear. And that's largely because at the time of the year that we did the thermal survey, there was a fairly uniform temperature across the site. So we're not seeing a great deal of difference. Um, so this is, this is a flattened DEM. Um, so we use a bit, piece of software called Anomaly to do terrain flattening. And what that allows us to do is um, flatten the, the, the larger kind of differences in the terrain whilst retaining microtopographic features. This isn't a great example, but you can see that the, that the circles sort of start to, to show up, but there's a lot of kind of noise over here, which isn't really, really helping. And then we've got the interpretation. So this is, this is the bit you had to believe me on. There's this feature over here um, that shows up that's different to the circles, but the geology changes straight down there. And we, we seem to have this, this difference on this side than this side. There's potentially um, another circular feature there. There's part of an arc of a potential another circular feature there. These two were a little bit dubious, um, but it's, you know, I, I think it's better to note them and then they can be checked on the ground um, rather than not put them in. So um, there's also a potential collection of pits, post holes, whatever these features might be. Uh, there's anomalies there that show up in the, uh, in the vegetation indices as well. So through combining all of that data, we've been able to sort of bring a, an interpretation to bear on the site that can then be going kind of ground truth um, in, a, in a future season. Yeah, so to note on that, we are um, hoping to go back in September uh, where the project will be doing some evaluation um, excavation and we'll get to look at those features. Um, in more detail and possibly get the, the chance to resurvey some of the other features that didn't necessarily show up in the geophysics, but the circles are very clear in the geophysics. One thing I'll, I'll just note actually on the, um, the micro topography. Um, so the circles you can see are starting to show up in places, 
um, as uh, uh, slightly raised. And the reason for that is, you now you could be misinterpreting them by thinking that they're banks. But in actual fact, the reason for that is because the resolution of the photogrammetry is so great that actually what we're looking at is the very minute difference in height of the vegetation. Obviously, the clover that's growing in the fill of a ditch is just that much higher than the, the, uh, the other vegetation around it. And of course, it's the clover um, that likes the fill of the ditches that's really showing up extremely well in the multispectral imaging because there's a lot of chlorophyll in clover. Anyway, moving on then to our next site, which is um, Stonehenge. So since 2013, um, uh, I've been asked, I've been working obviously in the Stonehenge landscape for, since 2006, but um, uh, from around about 2013, I've been asked on, periodically to go back and record the parch marks that uh, sometimes show up in the summer. Um, and so last year I was asked again to go back and and record those and I suggested that actually rather than just doing photographs that we did proper survey and we do photogrammetry, multispectral imaging and thermal imaging and uh, so you can see all the aircraft that I took there uh, to do that one morning. It was um, quite, we have to be there early in the morning and, and be finished before the public come in um, and of course that means that the conditions aren't necessarily perfect particularly for things like thermal imaging. Thank you. Um, it's quite dark on this screen, unfortunately. It looks good there. But um, the survey that, uh, that we did produced a high resolution orthophoto. So, this is the result of having all of the images stitched together. A few people showed you our Gisoft Metashape software earlier. And that's what we use, and that's kind of what we use to stitch all the photos together. Um, we've got then the digital elevation model overlaid onto satellite imagery. Um, with a hill shade relief on it so that you just kind of this is really more for presentation um, these tend to go in our reports because it's it's quite a sort of visual impact for people um, generally on research projects people know what they're looking at but we tend to find with commercial projects people might not kind of really understand what it is we've done or you know um, they, they might need some sort of uh, things visually that they can then show their clients and so we find that useful We've got a digital elevation model with elevation data on it that we, we tend to produce. And then we're going into hill shades. Um, I mean, Chris talked about the, the difference in sort of use of hill shades. We also use a relief visualization toolbox um, because sometimes hill shades don't pick up data that you want. You can't quite get the light in the right angle. Um, this is a multi-directional, the last one that was just on. They can be quite confusing. Um, so just using a digital elevation model with, with hill shades, which is great, it doesn't give you all of the data. So we did multispectral at Stonehenge as well, and it produced various different results between the, the different surveys that we, we used. Um, so this is the Asavi survey. I particularly ran this one because there was a reasonable amount of bare earth. That's why we were there to look for the parch marks. It didn't show us up a great deal. But then when we got to the, um, the GARI output, there was actually a lot more data starting to show up, um, a lot more features. So if we, could we move on to the interpretation? Oh, we've got, oh, sorry, the thermal, the thermal didn't really show us anything. Um, the Albury holes came out quite nicely because you know, they're kind of concrete and they've retained some heat and the stones show up quite well. And you can see the ditch, but it didn't really show us a, a, a great deal. Uh, this, is, this is an anomaly flattened um, psychedelic version of Stonehenge it's for t-shirts this one as only seen by the ancients on mushrooms um, and yeah the the final interpretation piece was put together through all of the all of the data we'd acquired so we looked at the thermal we looked at all of the different types of um, vegetation indices and that allowed us to pick out finer bits of, uh, of information that don't appear to be on other surveys. So not only were we able to go and record known parch marks, which was why we were phoned up and asked to go there in the first place, we were actually able to pick out data that um, we've not been able to find on other surveys elsewhere. So we're adding to the record. And then you know that data is all available. Somebody can um, take a look at that. And that can be interpreted further. We hope to go back to Stonehenge, actually, to get some more information to get on the ground with the GPS. and and do some more sort of data acquisition. Let me suggest 
different interpretive plots. The next Five slide. Minutes. Yeah, okay. okay, we'll quickly rattle through then on to uh, Arthur Stone uh, in Herefordshire, and this really uh, with uh, Manchester University. And I've been working at Arthur Stone for quite some years, um, but last year we were um, asked to go back again to record the excavations that um, Julian um, uh, uh, Thomas was doing. And then um, we suggested that we actually did a larger area around Arthur Stone itself to have a look what's going on in the landscape. So we did around about 40 hectares around Stonehen around Arthur Stone. So, thank you. I think we can skip most of these. Um, oh, so these these are just obviously aerial recordings of the excavation, um, and that's over a couple of years. So that's allowed us to produce a plot of the excavations as they were, and then feed that back to the guys in the field. So whilst they were still there, they were getting data back from us which was telling them exactly what they'd done. Um, they could ask us for GPS coordinates for alignments or anything like that, and then they could extend their trenches and you know, look at stuff on the fly dynamically from data that we'd gathered. Um, keep going, Adam. That's just a di digital elevation model with elevation data, hill shades. Right, okay, so this is, this is um, anomaly flattened and one of the one of the downsides to anomaly is sometimes it can't cope if there's a great difference in relief. But this one's actually come out quite well. Um, it's, it wasn't entirely usable for what I wanted, but what it did show is this big high point area here. And it's not something you notice when you're on the ground, that as you, as you approach the monument, there's actually a raised area in the background. So that started to become a little bit more interesting. And then we ran the vegetation indices on them. Um, interestingly, the the... The bedrock showed up really well uh, in the in the vegetation indices, and what it actually then started to show was these areas kind of here and here, which turn out to be quarries. This one is is likely to be modern. We've got anecdotal evidence from the farmer um, that this area was was quarried recently or more recently, but this is this is a much older uh, quarry, so this is probably going to bear investigation. The thermal again, the thermal nicely showed up the bedrock. Um, just due to the temperatures, and um, another feature, which is over here, which we'll look at, I think, at the end. And this is the interpretation um, of the data, of all of the data sets. So there's some kind of ridge and furrow. There's this feature here, um, which we'll show you in a moment. There's, sorry, go back. Um, there's some rectilinear features in the field, which we're not really sure what they are. They're, they may have been treating the crop um, we don't quite know, so it's something we need to look at. There's a potential um, circular feature here. This, this was a feature of very great interest, um, which is potentially um, a hitherto unknown long barrow. Uh, so we can move on to the next one. And so this is just to show the, I don't know if you can even see it on the screen, but this is just to show the, the difference between the vegetation index and the thermal. Um, if you can't see this, feature over here trust me it is there um, you won't be able to see it there but again trust me it is there I've stared at it long enough it's real um, we don't know what it is there's um, it, it needs to be investigated and interestingly this illustrates that had we only had the thermal probably wouldn't have seen it but because this appeared in all of our um, vegetation index plots I knew it's something that was probably real um, and then examining the area in the thermal, you can then just about pick out that it sort of shows up in the thermal as well. So were we to have only done thermal, we would have missed that feature. But because we did the uh, multispectral as well, we were able to identify it. And the important thing is, we're actually going to be able to ground truth this, this year. And so we'll find out whether I was talking rubbish or not. Yeah, that's it. That's the wonderful, wonderful thing about research projects and being associated with them for a long period of time. We can go back and um, and suggest that we might even put a test bit in there and just check to see what we found. Okay, we're going to wrap up there because time's running out. Thanks very much.